Well, I, it's so glad. I'm so glad to meet you, Asha. I'm. I am so impressed by the fact that. Um, I mean, a best-selling book, in for any book, is is a is no mean feat. But for a debut author, I think you deserve a lot of kudos. Thank you so much. I think publishing. Um, success in publishing often comes down to the right book at the right time. Yes. So, so it. what is it about 50 Words for Rain that has struck such a chord? And and what is it ab about this book that, that is the right book for, for the right time uh, in the world today and for readers today? Well, I think isolation has a lot to do with it. I think the fact that we do see a main character who is so isolated at the beginning of her journey resonated with a lot of people during COVID. So, you know, and that's the kind of thing I never could have predicted when I started writing this. I um, could never have really envisioned a pandemic. <laughs> it's true. It, it, I was thinking um, earlier that um, these kind of virtual events were pretty rare. And, and this is pretty much, this has been um, your book normal? tour, hasn't it? I've never done an in-person event. Since my book came out in September, it's always been Zoom. But ultimately, I think that's kind of nice because you can get together with people that you wouldn't be able to go see in person. And, and, and you can go barefoot. <laughs> yeah, hopefully moving forward, we can have a little bit more of a hybrid. <laughs> true, true, yeah. Well, what is it about this time period um, in Japan that that sort of captured your imagination? Why did you why did you want to to set the book in in this time period? Well, I think um, most World War II fiction focuses on the um, Europe, really. If I'm honest, um, it's usually written um, from a similar perspective and I definitely knew I wanted to do something different. I wanted to feature a young woman of color and I just wanted to tell a bit of a different story that we don't see every day. And um, I had a tremendous amount of fun with this. And I think um, hopefully you can show people things they hadn't thought about and still ultimately bring it around to we're all more alike than we are different. Good point. Yeah, I think. Well, it was mentioned earlier that you have a um, a degree in in English lit and creative writing. But did you also have a minor in history? Is, is that I right? did. I do. I was a history minor. I you, I I was a lit major in college, and I went to college for five years just for my BA because I couldn't decide on a major. And I finally I finally landed on literature simply because I like to read. I didn't. Yeah. have writing in mind as a career when I really? went to school. I love to write, but well, I- Oh, well, that's gone. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, we never know. See, well- No, we I, don't. We really don't. It was, it's only when I graduated from college that I, that I, I, I decided, well, I had no marketable skills, so let's try this writing thing. But I was curious with you, did you have a, a clear career trajectory in mind? Is, it, did, did your career path make you dis may, uh, determine your, your major and minor? Or did your major and minor determine your career path? You know, I, I, I think my career path chose my major and minor because I think I, unlike you, I think I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I simply had no idea how hard it was going to be. This is gonna sound so silly, but it was the, always really the only thing people ever complimented me on was my writing. So I, I just kind of thought, well, like this has to work, right? Everybody gets something. <laughs> Not always true. <laughs> it's true. I, I've, I've often said that um, one of the best parts of being, um, of being published when, when my first book was published was that my dad finally stopped asking me when I was going to get a real job. Oh and, my and, goodness. And, and, and dad, if you were watching, you know, I love you. Um, but no, he, it was just, you know, it, it took so long for me to get published that he was thinking, well, you know what, Sarah, you should have a fallback or something. Oh but, my <laughs> God. Drive me insane. I think I was querying for like three months when people started being like, Sarah, do you have a plan B? 
<laughs> yep. Yep. Oh my gosh. The plan B. Yeah. And I so didn't do you have no. any idea how that publishing is a long game and you can't come like every two months is the book out yet? No, like, no. <laughs> And the second book, and the second book, I, I know you're getting questions about the second book too. Yeah, it, it, uh, it's it's a crazy process, but uh, with you know the follow up to a successful first novel um, is is always it's always tricky. I mean, for me, it was it was a it was a fairly anxious experience writing that second book. I literally gained 20 pounds writing my second book. I mean, it was called The Sugar Queen. It was about candy. So, you know, there's that. But um, I think I, I worried that I wasn't able to, uh, what if my first book was a fluke and I wasn't able to do it again? Oh, so, I know. It's terrible. What about, well, with your second book, what, how, is it an anxious experience for you? Or did, when it, um, the success of your first book did, did was that validation and gave you confidence going into the second book um no no <laughs> I'm a train wreck right now but uh, I'm gonna get through it I well I I think so right anyway um as opposed to gaining 20 pounds I think I might be trending towards losing 20 pounds because i like stopped eating. I'm just like racked with all of this anxiety and I'm, I'm sitting here writing it and I'm, I'm criticizing myself in my own head. I can't write one sentence without being like, mm, no, like stop it. This is why we have editors, right? I can't, I can't do this to myself or it will never get written. I get it. I think, well, I, I think that's, I think that's natural across the board. We do tend to doubt ourselves, but uh, yeah. well, we're human. I don't know if people realize that there's real people behind these books in their hands. And no, it doesn't, totally and I think, you know, once you get into a cycle of, of, of self-doubt, it's hard to get out, it but is. you do have a successful book under your belt. You did it. You could do it again. The only difference I can see is that with first books, you tend to have a lot of time leading up to. And as I understand, you actually started writing your first book at 16 and I finished think, it in your early 20s. Is that right? Yes, uh, I'm in my mid 20s now. And uh, <laughs> the difference with the second book would be you're under a contractual deadline. And that's part yeah. of the anxiety. Mm -hmm. Help me. <laughs> Well, uh, any, any, any um, snippets about what the second book is about? It's called Hemingway's Daughter. And it is about a young girl named Delphine who was born in Paris in the late 1920s. She is the daughter of a French socialite and at least according to her mother, Ernest Hemingway, who, um, you know, was not known for being totally faithful to his wives. So I, I am currently working on uh, that. It's a historical fiction coming of age novel. If you liked the themes explored in 50 Words for Rain, as far as identity, belonging, family, finding one's place in the world, um, then there's a lot of that. Delphine is a very different protagonist from Nori, but um, hopefully people will grow to care for her. Well, speaking of Nora, let's let's get into the to the characters of Fifty Words for Rain. Um, with Nori, um, to me, she struck me as Jane Eyre esque. Um, I love that book. So. Yeah, oh, me too. Me too. I read it when I was seventeen, and oh my gosh, my world was never the same after Jane Eyre. But um, she she like like Jane Eyre. Nori, um, she's treated badly by a lot of people and um and yet she has this inner strength um that defies her circumstances so as the creator of nori where do you see her strength coming from is it unique to her character is it is it a family trait in her as, as for women in her family or is it part of the culture she lives in where, where does nori get her strength you know, I, I ultimately think that she develops it because she has to. I think people always say, oh, I could never do that or I could never survive that. Ultimately, you survive or you die. So we are very 
adaptable, resilient creatures. We are all stronger than we think. Remember that as you write your second book. <laughs> no, you, you can do me. this. You, you can. can. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'll like I'll do my best to keep that in mind, but like no promises. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, one of the other characters, we can't, we can't have a discussion about this book without, without talking about the grandmother. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think if, if there was a villain in this story, I think most people would agree that she, she was the villain and that she is rather villainous mm-hmm. on the surface. However, you give a few snippets and, and hints that the grandmother may be, she wasn't born this way. Maybe she was, she actually, her character developed because of her circumstances and the way she was treated. So if you could go back and rewrite 50 Words for Rain entirely from the point of view of the grandmother, would you, would readers be surprised that she is actually a little, uh, they would have a, a little more sympathy than they, than they, than, than at first glance the, at the book right now. I mean, not to excuse the fact that she does some horrible things in this book, but there are reasons behind that. Yes. So I ultimately think that, that the grandmother is very much a product of the time. I think she's a product also of an environment where women were not expected to hold positions of power. I think what we sometimes see with women who do a man's job, quote unquote, is that they feel like they have to be more ruthless than a man to earn their place there. I think she views emotion and love as feminine weaknesses that she can't afford if she wants to hold on to her position of authority. I think that shapes a lot of how she acts. She was she was an interesting character. I I, I it was you don't like her at first, but then no, you when you delve don't. into her character, I mean, you still don't really like her, but you tend to understand yeah. more about why she does the way she does. Yes. Well, I, I guess ex- <laughs> since Hemingway's Daughter is your upcoming book, that I think re- when readers get to the end of this book, I think we all had the same reaction, and that is, wait, what happens next? So you're not planning a sequel, is that right? I had no intentions to write a sequel at the time that I wrote uh, 50 Words for Rain or at the time it was published. The story goes on in my mind, I will admit, but as far as whether or not I'm willing to commit to writing another novel set in this universe, I can honestly say my answer is that I don't know. Yeah, never say never. It could come around. I'm not ruling it out. I mean, yeah, I I definitely think there's the third the potential for a sequel I just I don't know I'm afraid to mess with a good thing true I can understand that uh you know I was thinking um so you wrote you wrote the like the first three chapters um when you were a teenager and then came back to it in your early 20s and writers are often asked you know if if there are any of ourselves in our books Mm -hmm. um and I don't know if it's ever that cut and dry but I think sometimes our books are smoky mirrors of ourselves Mm -hmm. and I I like the fact that your book starts out when when Nori's a child and and you basically wrote those chapters when you were a child and then when you you came back to it you wrote it as 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 Nori as a as an adult and maybe sometime as you get older and you think wow what would Nori be like at this age so you never know I know. I, I mean, I just, the challenge here would be when the book ends, she's 26. So if I kept writing it, she would now be older than me in real life. So you have to um, wait a couple of decades. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it would be really interesting to try to take on life stages that I have not yet myself lived. It's true. Yeah. To wait until you're about 40 and then th- ask yourself, what would Nori be doing at 40? Right, exactly. I mean, I, 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 would, I would have to guess because I haven't, I haven't been on that leg of the journey yet. Oh, wow. Well, I, do you think that, that the book itself is, is a reflection of you in some ways? I mean, I, I, I know that um, you, you enjoy history. So there's, 
there's that. But do you think that, you know, because you wrote it when you were a teenager, the first three chapters, and then, and then later picked it up, do you see yourself a little bit in it? Or do you see your maturity as, as the book goes on? I do. I think, I think I describe Nori as kind of like a sister to me at this point. She grew up, I grew up, you know, she faced adversity. I faced adversity, you know, publishing this novel or trying to get this novel published definitely forced me to grow up a little bit. And I think, well, a lot of it. (laughs) And so, you know, I think at the time it finally happened, it was ultimately the right time to let this go. I feel like I'm finished now with that part of my growth. There's, I'm sure there's more to come. There will be, yeah, that you have yet untold stories forming in you, yeah. Um, I think, well, what were your favorite parts of the book? I mean, actually writing it, do you look more fondly back on those first three chapters or, I don't know, do you have, a? I I know uh, readers will often say this was my favorite part or this is my favorite part, but as a writer, what was your favorite part of the book? Probably the violin lessons. How I, you know, I wrote down a quote um, about um, the the musical part of that, uh, about the book. uh, And it was one of my favorite parts of it was you wrote, it seemed almost sacrilegious to spoil the silence that followed a perfect song. So talk about your love of music and how it influenced the book. I mean, I obviously love classical music. It's, it's all over the book. Um, and I, I think that for me, music is a language that translates um, across everything. You don't need words. And I think that's really powerful because I think Nori struggles to communicate with Akira sometimes. He's very, they're different. They're very different. And I think she realizes that this is her, she's, she's looking for a way to connect. She's desperate for a connection. And she knows that music is the way to him. But I, I think he finds it's the way to her as well. And I think he gets more than he bargained for with his little sister. And um, it was really fun to, to interweave my love of music with building their relationship. I love that. And I love, I love the part about, um communicating without words as a writer that um you know that's how we communicate but you also have this 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 other aspect to it do you play i do what do you play the violin but not that well (laughs) oh i i I, you know actually i took violin for about three years when i was a little kid and i just couldn't i just couldn't (laughs) I don't know what it is about it. My, my dad is quite musical. Is your family musical? No. No? <laughs> well, well th- this leads into how do your family and friends, how have they responded to, um, or have I already asked this question, to your success? <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. I am off the rails now. Um, uh, I had questions that I have off script now, but um, how have they responded to, your, uh, to the book and to, to the success of the novel? Um, for the most part, I've been very, very supported by everyone in my life. It's been really great. Um, there's a lot of people who I think had no idea that I was even writing a book who were kind of like, you know, it was like, I saw you on TV. And I'm like, yes, yes, I know. <laughs> I love that they didn't even know you were writing a book where you're just no. like <laughs> my dad had people calling him we have a fairly uncommon last name my dad had people calling him like I just saw this girl on tv do you know her <laughs> he's like yeah I've met her once or twice <laughs> oh I love that are, are your parents really proud yeah yes they are oh that's great I think, well, you know, I, I read, no, it was in, it was an interview you gave, um, you said that, um, that you called yourself a weird kid mm. and I, that was so dear to my heart because I think a lot of us can identify with that. You know, there are the weird kids unite, hashtag weird kids unite. Let's make that trend. Um, what would you say to 
kids out there who maybe aren't supported, you know, as, as your parents were, or my parents are, um, what would you say to, to the kid that doesn't fit the mold, who's struggling to find a place to belong, which is, and this is sort of a roundabout way of asking, what would you say to yourself as a kid from the place that you are right now? What would you say? Normal is easier, but weird lasts longer. I, I, what did you say? Normal might be easier for now, but weird lasts longer and you'll appreciate it down the road. Oh my gosh. By the time you crest 21, normal sucks. You don't want to be normal. The payoff will come. At the end of the day, middle school, high school, it's a couple of years. You have the rest of your life to embrace being weird and to do something that other people can't come up with. You know, people used to tell me I wasn't normal. And now I get to say that normal people don't have New York Times bestselling books at 26. So good. I'm glad weird paid off. That is beautiful. I think, I think there might be one or two people um, watching this who needs to hear, who need to hear that. So I that was great. That once upon a time. So. I love that. Oh, wow. Okay. Since I've got to go back to some of my questions, I went off the rails. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, oh, I was going to ask, um, did I, I don't know where I read this and it, I, did you, say that you were a baker I am a baker <laughs> I thought I, I read that somewhere I, and I thought because you know my food is my shiny thing so when I read that I went oh I, 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 she's a baker I'm going to ask her I was going to ask you what was your favorite thing to bake are you a stress cranberry baker muffin. do what cranberry muffin oh ooh, la la see now I'm hungry <laughs> I love, oh they're so good and I okay cranberry orange muffins oh, yes cranberry orange scones yeah. yes they're I love that so combination yeah I just got an air fryer and let me tell you I am super excited to attempt to bake in it because the instructions say that you can and I'm gonna go oh. I will be testing that theory out oh my gosh <laughs> see I, I envy your baking ability because I love to eat but I I, I don't cook so <laughs> Oh my goodness, but get yeah. Get an air fryer. <laughs> get an air fryer. You don't need to be able to cook. It's like literally idiot. <laughs> uh, well, I I got a I have a I got a toaster oven from from someone who didn't know I didn't know how to cook and I did actually try it. No, it was it was a disaster. I would, you know. Oh no. I know. <laughs> but before you know, I I was going to ask if you actually ate at your computer screen as you as you wrote as I do because I literally have cookies right over here so <laughs> do, do you have food nearby <laughs> I don't I do have my bubble tea here I'm kind of obsessed with these I need to learn I think really need to start making them at my house because they're about six dollars a piece and I get one like every other day and <laughs> it is replaced my my Starbucks habit and but I can't stop they have those sort of very large straws, don't they? The two, the they bubble do. tea. So they have these straws and you fit, um, the bubbles come through the wide straw. <laughs> a very strange sensation as I remember. It's been a while since I've had one, but <laughs> of course, of I course it's food. That you're, yeah. <laughs> okay. So one of my best friends in middle school was an exchange student from Taiwan and oh. she turned me on to bubble tea. Thank oh, you. Wow. I'll never let it go. When, well, I, I know the pandemic has put a, a hold on your traveling, but, but you do like to travel, don't you? I do. I'm, I'm very nomadic. I actually get restless if I'm in the same place for too long. Well, the pandemic in many ways has been hard, but for, for a nomad, I'm sure it, it was oh, yeah. very hard. It, it's been really tough. And I miss my friends. I've got friends, you know, kind of scattered all over. I, I don't really have actually oddly I don't have as many in the states anymore um it's been tough oh wow what did you travel to Japan to do research I did well okay so originally I went there to eat and then it turned into a research trip (laughs) you're a girl after my own heart yeah I could talk about (laughs) food the whole time I really could (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) 
And now I'm getting hungry. These these cookies are calling to me. Um, but for well, for the second book, what what kind of research has that entailed? So that one has been tougher because I haven't been able to go anywhere. I've been to New York. I've been to Paris. I've not been to Cuba. Um, and so right now I'm kind of working from books and pictures and 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 movies. Um, and I'm doing the best I can to capture the setting there. But it's a different process. I, I will go one day, but probably not in time to make a difference for this book. The, that has been part of your process. That was part of your process for 50 Words for Rain too, wasn't it? I think I read that that a lot of the research and it was um, documentaries or, 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 or maybe it was- documentaries and yeah. old movies. <sighs> yeah. Definitely. What well, there's some very famous movie that takes place in Havana. Is it Casablanca? No. I can't remember. But like I'm gonna find it and watch it. And I, I, the pandemic has been, you know, sort of the watch things you normally wouldn't or um wow, yeah, what is this? Yeah. A chunk of my life now is just watching stuff and you know, like because you can't really go anywhere, I think that we've had to expand. I mean, book sales actually improved because people are stuck at home. I guess that's something. Okay, true. Yeah. And yes, I think um, I completely forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I'm thinking about cookies again. Um, <laughs> I know. Now I'm hungry. <laughs> Oh, I know what I was going to ask. It, it had to do with your writing process and actually, um, you know, if, if a lot of your research has to do with you document documentaries or um, it, do you do a lot of your writing on paper? Hmm. Or no. do, you, do you write completely, you know, to the, on the computer, computer screen? screen? Yeah, I, I, my handwriting is, no one should ever have to see that. So. <laughs> Amen. I understand. Yeah. I found that, so, you know, my brain doesn't work as fast. I'm uh, a millennial, you know, I learned cursive in like second grade and then I never hand wrote anything again. It, well, I think it's easier when you have an idea to die. If you're a, a fast enough typer, the, the ideas yeah. come out and you can actually get oh. them down faster on the computer screen. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've mainly been spending most of my time like carting my MacBook Air around, finding tiny spots to hide in and write. And obviously COVID killed that too, because nowhere is letting you like sit in, you know, it's all like, just get what you came for and leave. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's been a little stifling, but things are picking up and I'm very happy about it. Amen. Amen. You, um, with, how much of a perfectionist are you when it comes to writing? Not healthy at all, but oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, I am my own worst enemy sometimes. Like I, I don't, you should never read back what you write. Like you write it and you're like, oh, well, that's pretty good. And then other people are like, oh yeah, this is great. And then you go back and read it and you're like, <laughs> you know, it's terrible. <laughs> It doesn't get easier. I have published books I go back to and go, oh my gosh, if only I could, you know, erase this in every single book. <laughs> you will always find things. And that's why at one at some point you have to let it go, don't you? You do. It you, does. You can nitpick it to death until the end of time. It's true. You know? It's true. So, yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. They it, it, <laughs> it you know, it, it's only until you start talking to other writers that you realize that these are pretty common things because uh, Writing is such a solitary endeavor, except for some people. I think the, I, I remember reading something about the author of The Godfather, whose name escapes me. Um, he, he wrote his first book in the chaos of his dining room table with his kids running around. And after the success ah. of that book, he tried to write, you know, he got himself an office and, and he tried to write in the solitary way. And he couldn't, he thrived in the chaos. But I think for most of us, Hilarious. we are, we are very solitary in front of our computers in our own minds, but it I helps. I was afraid with that person because my life has been nothing but chaos. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I, I am, yeah. It's a killer. I mean, I really want an office. That's right. I'm, I'm in the process of hopefully trying to get like 
a place to own as opposed to rent, just like to have that stability and like maybe have an office and be able to accumulate more cooking items. So <laughs> I'm hoping we will see a spike in productivity, but I, I, I make no promises either. <laughs> The best laid plans. I know. I know. <laughs> how do you write? How, how do I write? I, am, I do have an office. This is my office here right now. And um, oh, thank you. I'm I have, do what? I'm very jealous of oh. how well organized your Zoom background is. Well, it, it helps that I actually knocked off a lot of stuff here. <laughs> yeah. And I closed the office door so the cat isn't walking around. But um, mine is sleeping. And actually, I spent every time I'm on Zoom, I'm like, please don't wake up. Please don't wake up. Please don't wake up. Because he will mount himself on the screen. Like, yeah. You look at themselves and go, oh, who is that pretty cat? <laughs> no and then they'll be like he's big he's a big boy and I'm like oh my gosh so now what we're supposed to be talking about <laughs> I <laughs> pound cat uh, how how big 16 oh my goodness he's a big boy <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yeah I I saw something on Twitter not too long ago that had that was the rules of zoom was number one always unmute Number two, if you have a cat, let us see the cat. Number three, what is the cat's name? And number four, tell the cat it's a pretty cat. So <laughs> I think mean, cat lovers can understand that. I love that. People have been very patient and understanding. Once he actually ended my Zoom call because he shut the computer screen. Oh my gosh. I won. 6.23 and I haven't fed him yet. And their stomachs do have time clocks. That's that's very true. I had a cat once um, before I was even published, trying to get uh, trying to to get published. Um, I actually was writing and then went away to do something and came back and she had hit the space bar. And so I had twenty three pages of absolutely blank pages. So <laughs> life with cats. Yeah. That is hilarious. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. Let's see if I have any more questions here. Oh, I was going to ask, is 50 words for rain actually translated in, into Japanese yet? No, it's not. It, <gasps> you know, oddly, it's really tough to get books translated into languages in the country that they take place in. Like a lot of people write books that in Paris and they very rarely get translated into French. There's something about an American writing it that doesn't I guess doesn't resonate as well or, or appeal as well to the uh, general population. However, I do have several people uh, I know who live in Japan and they've all read it in English. Um, so yeah, some of them actually helped me write it. So do you speak Japanese? I think I read that, didn't you? you, you yeah, so I studied Japanese for about mm, 13 years. I, I speak pretty well, but I'm shy. <laughs> Oh, wow. I think that that's great that you actually came from that, that point of view that you actually understood the language um, and coming into this. Yeah. I'm not like perfect or anything, but like I, I could get around. <laughs> I think that's great. Oh, wow. Okay. Let's see. Oh, I, well, okay. I think I'll just end on this note and then I'll turn it over to Malaprops. And I was going to um, ask, well, first of all, you know, Ash, Asheville where where um oh ha have you ever been to Asheville no I haven't and I actually I just recently became hyper aware of Asheville because I've turned into my mother and I started watching house hunters <laughs> so I'm officially like old I guess <laughs> <laughs> well if, if you come to Asheville you, Malaprops and I will will show you around but Asheville I, was so I wasn't aware it was so trendy I mean that there was like this like six hundred fifty thousand um, dollar house that they bought in Asheville, and it ended up like going into a bidding war, and it was already so expensive. And I was just like, wow, I guess a lot of people must want to live there right now. Yeah, you'd say the real estate market is crazy in Asheville. Yeah. yeah. But, well, we're very right. We're, we're a writerly city, and we have a really rich history, uh, literary history. And so I thought I would, I would end on maybe my fellow Ashevillians and, and fellow Malaprops bookstore lovers. We would like to know what your favorite writers are, your favorite books, and what was the last great book you read? 
Okay. My favorite writers. My favorite writer is uh, Khaled Hosseini, The Kite Runner and A Thousand Splendid Sons. I just, I don't really have words. They, they saved my life. I read both those books in a, a really difficult time for me and, and they really like made me want to stick around and maybe one day make people feel like that. Love that. I love that. Um, and then I am also a fan of um, The Henna Artist by Alpha Joshi. And her new book actually just came out, The Secret Keeper of Jaipur. And then I also recommend White Ivy by Susie Yang. Wow. Great. I oh, love that. Oh, wow. Well, thank you, Asha. It was such a pleasure to speak with you. This was great. Um, and I'll just turn it over oh, to Malaprop great. to see if there are any other questions. Thank you. We do have uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, it's been great to listen to the two of you chat. Um, and I can't speak for anyone else. I personally love it when author talks include conversations about food and cats <laughs> and, you know, and, and life um, just kind of, you know, outside of, of writing books, because, you know, I appreciate what you, what you said Asha earlier about the fact that, that there are people who perhaps don't quite connect to the fact that they're just sort of regular people behind the books they read. Um, and so that's one of the great things about hosting author events. One of the reasons why we do it, in addition to celebrating the fact that there are books of the world to read and that we appreciate the fact that writers write them. It's also about connecting to authors as people. So yeah, uh, yeah so I, I feel like y'all have you'll have done that uh, this evening connected with each other and with our audience uh, or our, with our audience on a you know just a nice basic human level um it's also great uh you know during a pandemic even though folks are getting out more there's still you know things are still a little bit different in terms of human connections so. oh yeah Thank you for that. Uh, so I'd like to start with a question that we actually had emailed into us prior to the event, and it's for both of you. Um, and you've touched on this, but I, I would love for you to, to maybe give us a, a little bit more insight uh, or a, a picture of your writing process. Um, and we uh, had Diane asking about what your routine looks like. Um, when you're writing. And I know for a lot of, one of the conversations, we, the way it's often framed is, uh, or one of the big questions is, are you a pantser or a plotter, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's, you know, so then we can usually talk about that and then also about, you know, what your, what your writing day might look like. Asha, if you'd like to start. Sure. Um, I would say I'm closer to a pantser, but I have started to do synopsises or synopsi. Which one is it? <laughs> I was starting to do chapter summaries recently and um, it's really helped actually. It, it really helps keep me on track because otherwise I'll just be like, ooh, Ireland, Ireland's kind of interesting. Let's go to Ireland. And it's like, no, that's not what this novel is about. You know, so it, I definitely find it helps keep my limited attention span on track if I plot out the events of each chapter before I write it. And then there's still plenty of room in there for improv, which I do frequently. And that's why I have very gifted editors to take all my weird stuff out down the line. Excellent. And what about you, Sarah? I, I am, I'm pretty much a pantser. I, I, I always have been, it's in it's, I always want to be a plotter I, because I, I just right, think the process would go so much <laughs> easier and, and I wouldn't have to delete pages upon page the, <laughs> of things that I really like but have nothing to do with the no, book and not relevant at all exactly <laughs> yeah and I think I, it's just coming to the um the realization that it's going to take as long as it takes and that in the mm that the angst is part of the process that 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 is just the way I write I that it's going to be a little painful and but there will be sparks of joy and then um then you're very glad when it's over <laughs> and it's done I, I, I'm not sure I really like writing but I like having written yes writing is hard yeah writing is hard it's not always pleasant in the moment but then there's there's this feeling of such satisfaction when you finally finish a chapter 
and you're happy for like three minutes and then you have to start writing the next chapter and you're like oh gosh how did I do this again what's happening exactly (laughs) overwhelmed (laughs) I wonder if it gets easier because a lot of people have asked me oh you must be like an old hat by now and I'm like no 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 book two is is in a way even harder than book one true very true and 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 you sort of you you eventually realize that that is part of your process. And, and if you've discovered that part of the outline does help you, then that's, that's part of the learning process. We're always yeah. learning. There's never a point where you can say, Absolutely. you know, I am excellent at this. Right. Bam. And every book is different too. It's true. So, you know, it's, we, we can try, we have best laid plans and everything, but ultimately each book comes together in its own way and its own time. Mm-hmm. Yep. I think that's always, uh, that's, I mean, it's, that's great advice in a lot of uh, realms of our lives, really, you know, situations are different and, and we just have to allow space for that, uh, but particularly for, uh, for writers. Um, yeah, that's good advice for the writers in our audience to walk away with. Um, and then speaking of which, Sarah, um, you know, you got Asha to talk about uh, her next book. Um, feel free to politely say, no, thank you. I don't want to discuss this, but I'm going to pose the question from the audience about what you might be working on and and coming up next. Um, Nicola is uh, joining us from Devon, England uh, and and first expresses appreciation uh, to you, Sarah, for your wonderful Sunday short stories um, and is, is wondering if you have another book. I do actually I finished it it is done it is at the publisher the editing process is all done um it took congratulations a long- yeah, thank you it was, a long- it was a long time coming I I, I I took a long time off I think um some people who who do follow me on social media do know that um my mom and my sister died within days of each other and it was a very hard process and I didn't write for a long time not for you know I think a couple of years um well my mom was very sick leading up to her death and my sister's death was quite sudden so emotionally it was like oh my gosh and I couldn't find this I couldn't find you know the words yet and then I finally you know you you sort of come out of this, you sort of heal and, and, you know, you find your way. And I did finish the the book. I had actually started it before my mom got sick and um, I, there's not a pub date and, and there's no, there's not a cover yet. Um, I, I think we have landed on the title, but I've been wrong about titles before. I've said this before that with my, with my book, um, girl who chased the moon i actually called it festival of the naked lady so and i thought well okay we're going to keep that title no nope. um but so I'm, I'm hoping we keep the title but you know as soon as i knew more about um the pub dates and everything i'll be sure to post it i'll be shouting from the rooftop so oh and you so deserve to and i'm you're a fighter and i'm sure that the book will be excellent yeah. oh thank you yeah. Yeah, there yeah. yeah there's in it i'm in i'm sure there are I know there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people in addition to Nicola who are um, super excited um, for whenever it arrives um, for them to pick up. I am so Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Wonderful. So um, we've got another question uh, for both of you. um, And this is from Andrea um, or Andrea. I said Andrea, I have a friend who, who says Andrea, and then I realize I don't. So um, pardon me for <laughs> mangling your name. Um, uh, you both write about fish out of water characters. And um, I'm curious about what draws you to them. Uh, and you've talked a little bit about weirdness, um, but uh, Sarah, maybe starting with you on this one. I, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of, um... Uh, well, like Asha and I were talking about, I think a lot of people can identify with the with with the fact that sometimes we don't always feel like we belong, and we have this perception that everyone else has has knows so much more or or knows the secret, and we don't to to belonging and and feeling at home in our own skin sometimes. So I think it's just a, it's a natural 
um, it comes out of a natural place of, you know, of, of my own feelings of, you know, growing up thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I, 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 I wish I could find, you know, the path I was supposed to take or where I belong. Um, but I think it's just, it's, I think it's a part of, I like the idea of, of, you know, exploring relationships with each other, but I also think it's really important to explore relationships with ourselves. And I think that's part of the journey of understanding ourselves. Yeah, definitely. I mean, do we ever understand ourselves? It's a lifelong process. It is such mm-hmm. a lifelong process, you know, and like that's our job as, as authors is also our job as human beings is to always be thinking about that and figuring that stuff out. That's a, that's a wonderful, a wonderful point, a wonderful acknowledgement again for all, you know, to connect on a human level. Um, and, and Asha, you, you did speak to, you know, that, um, <laughs> it was so great hearing you talking, talking about, you know, basic, you know, about being weird and embracing that. Right. And so it sounds like that's part of how sort of fish out of water characters resonate for you. You also, you know, uh, mentioned Jane Eyre, who was one of, one of those for sure. Yeah. Um, is there anything else about that? dynamic that fish out of water uh, kind of um, uh, lived experience um, that you're particularly drawn to as you write yeah i i think that i i definitely am drawn towards these kinds of stories as a reader and i think that ultimately shaped what i chose to write about and i think you know historical fiction is is my favorite genre and i also have notice there's a a real distinct lack of of people of color in that particular area of fiction. It's gotten so much better across the board, but I would say this is still one of those spots where it's just for very um, homogenous and I've read some amazing stories, but I I think there's room for more. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Yes, there is room for more. And there's, I, I think, and I hope it continues. We're finally getting to the point where we recognize that there really is plenty of space to tell a, just tell a lot more stories and give voice to uh, a lot more people who have been um, sidelined, you know, in terms of, of, you know, the books that we have access to. Um, I know that it was quite a while in my reading life before I picked up a book that had characters that I felt reflected me. And I enjoyed the books I was reading, um, uh, but there is something about, you know, also being able to pick up books and not have it be, uh, uh, you know, a tremendous endeavor to find, <laughs> right? Books that reflect the fact that, that people who, you know, who may overlap with, with one or more of your identities um, uh, you know, have, are reflected in, you know, fiction and there's historical a, fiction in particular. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. There's a yeah. lack of that in, and you know, it just, I think it, it stems from the fact that for so long, Europe has been viewed as the only setting for this kind of novel to the point where if you, if you stray from that, there's this weird round of interrogations. Like, why would you ever want to write like about something outside of Europe, like you must have some sort of personal connection. And it's like, yeah, I might have a personal connection. I might also um, acknowledge the existence of other places in the world. You know, there's there's not really this line of questioning when American authors choose to write about, you know, France or Poland or Germany in World War II, it's just considered normal. Well, I appreciate, um, like I say, just the fact that there's more space for all the stories, and, uh, and how, so that how yeah, great, yeah. How great is it when you when you find that book and you find that identification in a book? Going, there's someone out. There, there's me in a book, yeah, or there is. It's like me, and they don't have to be exactly like you. It doesn't need to right. be a mirror. Yeah. But there's just there's more for you to grip onto. There's more layers. The character is grappling with things that you yourself have grappled with. And it just really changes the experience for the better. Yeah, and, for sure. And, and therein is the beauty 
of literature, of books, is that we can yeah. find our tribe yeah. between pages. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. So um, more questions. Uh, sorry, I'm just, you know, <laughs> a host prerogative. I'm just <laughs> sort of veering off. Um, so uh, Jennifer, actually, this is a little bit of a follow-up to, to something y'all talked about before. Jennifer's asking, Asha, did the story change in your mind between the first few chapters written when you were younger and the remainder of the book uh, written when you were older? Oh my goodness, it definitely did. I mean, the first three chapters really are relatively unaltered, which is, I think, a small miracle because I struggled so much with the middle of the book. I rewrote it ad nauseum. I mean, it was just ridiculous. I mean, I grew up while I was writing this. My thought process changed. My experiences changed. I suppose you could say I became a tad more cynical even as I as I aged and um then towards the end, I think I started to have a little faith in humanity again. So I, I think we see um, that struggle and that dichotomy in the book. And um, another question about 50 Words for Rain, Asha, uh, from Rebecca, who loves the sibling relationship in the book and wants to know if you have siblings, uh, if you care to share that. Um, and if so, does that bond inform the Akira Nori uh, story? So I do have a brother, but it's a totally, totally, totally different relationship from Nori and Akira's relationship in the book. Um, that relationship is the kind of relationship I would have loved to have had. And so I suppose we may call that wish fulfillment. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it's interesting too, um, because I, I think, I mean, as I say, there's, there's lots of stories, um, but often with uh, historical fiction, um, the kinds of relationships are not those kinds of relationships, mm. right? Like you end up with, with romantic relationships, certainly with sort of like protagonist villain relationships with other sorts of tension, um, but the sibling you know, relationship being central um, also feels like a, like a fresh way for people to connect with the story. I'm a firm believer in platonic soulmates. I don't think that your soulmate is always the person that you wanna be with romantically or physically. I think that sometimes the person whose soul matches yours can be a family member or a friend or a cat. You know, I just, I think there's a lot more possibilities than we see explored on a day-to-day -day basis in books. That's, I think it's almost like the frozen effect. I think that's what, part of what made that movie such a juggernaut was that in the end, it wasn't a man, you know, it wasn't a man who, who saved her. The guy turned out to be a jerk. It was her sister. And those are such important relationships and oftentimes so much more long lasting, deep friendships. Oh, absolutely. I mean, these and, relationships. And familial relationships. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and oftentimes not, the, not your family by blood, right? Either. Oh, I'm also a huge believer that you don't pick your relatives, but you do pick your family. Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's a great thought. Um, Sarah, I know, and you've written a variety of relationships in your books that people, you know, really, um, identify with. I think that's one of the reasons why folks connect so much to your, um, to your books. Um, that and the food and, and the sort of <laughs> magic of them, right? Um, but yeah, but what, what do you think about that, about, you know, writing, um, you know, connections with people that aren't the sort of, you know, that, that aren't, not that there's anything wrong. I, I love a good romantic relationship in a book, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but relationships that are, that are, uh, other kinds of relationships. I, 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 I like the idea of, um, well, like, well, like finding your tribe um, in that, and that as um, you get older, you, you tend to realize that, you know, you have your family, you have your friends, you have your soulmate, but they're, they're all a part of your tribe. And, and one is not more important than the other, that it's actually a, the conglomeration of them all mm -hmm. and I think that is you know that's part of what n novels do is that they they show 
um, that it's not always romantic and it's not always familial. Familial. Um, it 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 it's friendships and it's you know our connection with animals and and nature. Mm-hmm. So I think we'll, so we'll end on, um, the last question is for you, Sarah, um, before I, before I get both of your final thoughts for this evening. Um, and I think it's a great question again, not so much about writing, but, uh, but a great question, uh, which is, uh, also from Jennifer, Sarah, if you don't cook, how in the world, and I'm quoting, how in the world do you find, test, or choose the recipes and food for your books? It's <laughs> a great question. It <laughs> is a very good question. <laughs> well, you know, um, it, it's sort of going back to my mom. Um, and, and after my mom um, got sick, she had a, um, a brain hemorrhage that left her, um, you know, profoundly brain damaged for about four years. And during those four years, I lost a lot of weight and I have been, and I've been heavier most all my life, certainly all my adult life. And I didn't realize until I lost my mom on that emotional level. And then, you know, lost her four years later, how much I equate food with love. And so I, 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 I love to eat, but I love to look up recipes online. I love looking at food on Pinterest. It, it, it's just, it's, it's so much a, a part of a, 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 an emotion for me. So it's, so it sounds like it's not, you know, you, you can end up putting food in a book really based on like what the, how the ingredients draw you in and how, you know, pictures you've seen of the food uh, draw you in, whether you can cook it or not. Right. It, 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 all, it all comes down to emotion for me. It's yeah. a, you know, it's not necessarily the pre- preparation or even the eating, although I do love to eat yeah. and I'm still thinking about these cookies. <laughs> my little molasses oatmeal <laughs> molasses cookies here but it is uh, in my books you know there are emotions um even in gar- uh, garden spells about how certain foods will actually the, that this caterer makes will actually make you feel something mm-hmm. that's what it boils down to for me yeah well thank you uh sarah and asha and asha if we had another hour i would actually circle back around to the fact that you went to japan to eat and ended up doing research and i'd love to hear more about <laughs> about the, <laughs> the your your visits to japan in particular um but uh but we had you know great questions from the audience so i wanted to to honor their questions first so maybe some other time yeah <laughs> i would love to come there when this yeah. whole thing um over with and we'd and love to have your, you your trendy store <laughs> in yeah um yeah that's one of the it, it is that it's also it's also beautiful the blue ridge mountains are oh are i'm really you no know, i bet i bet it's completely gorgeous you know so we look we look forward to it um, and so I, I will end with just giving you both the opportunity to leave us with any thoughts you would like to leave us with. Um, Sarah first and then Asha, um, we're celebrating your book tonight. We'll give you the last word, uh, Sarah. Uh, thank you to Malaprops and it's so nice to meet you, Asha. And thank you for everyone who watched. It's always wonderful just to be able to talk about books and writing and food. And so it's been a great experience. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Asha. Thank you so much for having me. It was wonderful to meet you, Stephanie. Thank you, Sarah, for agreeing to moderate this event. We are agent siblings. We have to meet at some point. It's yeah. true. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, we have to meet. And I know you you don't really cook, but I do. And I will make you whatever you want. There's an offer. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> to show up on your doorstep on <laughs> okay <laughs> call first <laughs> um so this has been delightful um, thank you both so much and to everyone out there thank you for joining us uh we look forward to seeing you virtually and eventually in person uh, and we so appreciate you thank everyone. you all so much yeah stay safe and well we'll see you soon bye